Welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to be discussing kind of an overview of shrews, shrew relatives, and bats around the world and here in Montana, starting with shrews and the group that shrews belong to. Now, once upon a time, um, before we had a lot of good genetic data to do phylogenies, shrews were placed in the order Insectivora, along with lots of other things, such as hedgehogs and golden moles and tree shrews and elephant shrews and colugos and just all the kind of leftover species that didn't fit into other orders. We don't do this anymore, but you might still encounter the term insectivora. After moving on from this, the term sericomorpha became popular. That's the shrews and the moles. So not including the hedgehogs or the golden moles or the elephant shrews or anything else. And this term you might still see, but we don't use it anymore. Because in order to make a monophyletic group, we have to include hedgehogs and their relatives. So we end up with the order Eulipotyphla. You meaning true, lipo meaning fat, typhla meaning blind. This is the truly fat and blind order. Um, it's still worth knowing Insectivora and Sericomorpha, not because you'll be tested on it, but because you may still encounter um, people or systems using the old names, especially something like um, for management that doesn't care as much about phy exact phylogenetic relationships, you might still see um, shrews listed under Sericomorpha. In fact, I think that the checklist of North American mammals may still list shrews under order Sericomorpha. But we're st going to use Eulipotyphla because that is you know, better in terms of describing the phylogeny and evolution of these groups. Within Eulipotyphla then, we have several different families. Selenodons, right here, we have two species. Um, these are weird. They split off from other animals a long time ago. They only live in a couple of Caribbean islands and they um, have venomous saliva. And I'd say it's probably the size of maybe between a hedgehog, a little bigger than a hedgehog, a little smaller than an opossum. In the hedgehogs, we don't have any hedgehogs in the United States, unfortunately, but there are hedgehogs in the Eastern Hemisphere as well as gymnures, which are basically hedgehogs without any spines, and the moon rat, which looks like a, um, a possum, is completely unrelated. It's actually a giant, weird hedgehog thing, nocturnal. It's, it's cool. Then in Talpidae, we have the moles, which we do have in North America, but we don't have any moles here in Montana. So we won't talk about them anymore, but they are really cool. And it's too bad that we don't have any in Montana. Um, within the mole family, there are a few other things, including shrew moles. The one on the left, the American shrew mole, is found on the Pacific coast in um, kind of the coastal forest. And there are also some shrew moles in Eurasia, which as you can see, looks like a shrew, is related to a mole. And desmonds on the right, found in Eurasia, are basically aquatic moles, shrew things that, again, look really cool. But now we've gotten to the family that we do have in Montana, Sericidae. So there are a lot of species of um, Sauricidae, Sauricids in the world. I'm not going to talk about any of them except to maybe highlight this one. The Utruscan shrew is arguably, because it's not super clear, there are a few contenders, but possibly the world's smallest mammal. You can see it there, kind of held in someone's fingers. But the rest of the shrews of the world I'm not going to really talk about because they all are small and shrew like, and I mean, their shrews. Here in Montana, we have uh, 
11 species of shrew. Um, but we have, um, we're only covering one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sorex species. And those are the ones with little asterisks. I'll go over it at the end. They're all, I mean, they're all shrew-like, um, except the water shrew is kind of unique because it is aquatic and has different coloration. And you can see it there with the little tadpole that it, it got. But we do have one shrew species that I find particularly interesting, that is Blarina brevicata. This is a different genus than Sorex. And let me just point out, Sorex means shrew. It's in the Sorisidae family, Sorex idae, shrew family. All the families end with idae. But this is different. This is a different genus, Blarina brevicata. And this species has venomous saliva. Several shrews have venomous saliva, like the selenodon that I mentioned earlier, but because this animal is small, it can kill small animals with its venom up to its size. But if you get bit by this, it's not gonna be deadly, but it will hurt. Also, cool thing about shrews, um, and not just this species, is that shrews can echolocate. Now, it's not the same level as bat echolocation, but they can still send out little clicks and get a sense of kind of the general surrounding, kind of what type of habitat, if it's, you know, say, enclosed or what type of leaf litter or um, how open, that type of thing are the stuff that this species can do. So then moving on to bats, family Chiroptera, Chiro meaning hand, Ptera meaning wing. So these are the flying mammals. I'm sure everyone here knows what bats are. One of the um, most interesting families within the bats are Pteropodidae, the fruit bats, fruit bats and flying foxes. So these are all generally large and have large eyes. Some of them are diurnal, many are still nocturnal. A lot of them eat fruit. We don't have any in North America or South America. These are all Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and Australia. Also in that part of the world, we have these bats with crazy faces, lots of species, two different families. These leaf-nosed and horseshoe bats, horseshoe meaning like a horseshoe shape of the nose, have these crazy nose appendages for helping with echolocation. Now, as an example of conversion evolution, we have this family of New World uh, leaf-nosed bats that have their own crazy nose appendages for echolocation. We don't have any of these bats in Montana, but they are in the United States, especially in the Southwest. So I want to stay in this family because it has some cool bats. So top left, we have the Honduran white bat. Now this bat uh, forms colonies where groups of bats will make tents by cutting leaves and pulling together a little shelter. And then on the bottom left is the fisherman bat, which you can see is grabbing a fish. They actually dive over the water and will use their feet to scoop a fish out of the water and eat it. And then on the right is the vampire bat. I'm sure everyone has heard of vampire bats. Vampire bats are really cool and misunderstood, but they do um, target livestock. And when the animal is sleeping, it will bite it and release um, a, an anticoagulant so the blood keeps flow, uh, flowing and a sedative so that the animal doesn't feel it. And so then it's just kind of leaking blood out of that hole and it licks it up. It's not sucking straight out of the animal, but just makes a little wound and laps it up. So there are other species sorry, other families of bats that I'm not gonna talk about because we don't need to go into that detail. 
But the last family that I will mention and the one that is most important because it is the one that we are, need to know for this class is Vespertilionidae. The Vesper bats, evening bats, common bats. If you generally think of a bat, you're thinking of one of these bats. Huge family, lots of species found all over the world. Like these bats are super widespread. So let's focus on some of the Montana species. We have pallid bat, spotted bat on the left. Both of those are relatively rare, but are found in Montana. The big brown bat and the Townsend's big eared bat, which I guess you can tell why they're called that in both cases. And then the hoary bat, eastern red bat, and silver haired bat. The eastern red bat is rare. We're not going to cover it in this class. If anyone does see this, I mean, you would probably recognize that it's the red bat since it's the reddest of the bats that we have. But then the last group of bats is the genus Myotis. These are the little brown bats. Myotis, myo means mouse. Otis is for ear. These are the mouse eared bats. And they're small and they have pointy ears that aren't that big and it's really 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 hard to tell them apart um, if you have the skin it's hard to tell them apart if you have the skull it's hard to tell them apart so we're just going to lump all these together and just call them my myotis so for identification these are all the species that we have we, so we have eight um, shrew species, and we have six bat species, counting myotis as one, because we have all of these eight different species of myotis here. This I'm just calling myotis sp. Sp period means some species within that genus. So myotis sp means some myotis, but we don't know which. SPP means multiple species within the genus, where again, it doesn't really matter what the specific species is. So for the skulls, we're gonna have all of the um, shrew skulls and we have five bat skulls. For the skins, we're gonna have two of the shrew skins and the other shrews we'll just call sorex sp it is some sorex skin because the shrews are really hard to tell apart and then we have five bat skins hoary bat silver um forget what that's called the silver something bat long uh your townsend's long-eared bat big brown bat and little brown bat and check out the other videos for information about how to actually do the identification for the skins and the skulls.